Hello everyone. Welcome to a follow-up discussion on learning real-world vulnerability research. The last discussion uh, discussion video we did was on making the shift from CTF to real-world. Yeah, and this kind one, of an overview uh, was the last video. Now we're actually going to dive into some of the details. Yeah, exactly. So in this one, we'll be talking more about the vulnerability research specifically, um, the challenges of getting into it, and just an overview of what's involved and, and how to get started in it. Uh, Timestamps are in the description for those who want them. Uh, so with that said, I will also say we're open to discussion because these points are from our perspectives. So if you have any anything you want to add or any points that you have an issue with and want to discuss, um, you can join our Discord. We're, we're always free to talk in there. Uh, or you can leave comments in the uh, in the video as well, and we'll, we'll try to get to those. So, yeah, and I'll, I'll say, like, especially on this topic, I think there are going to be some people who really disagree with our kind of recommendations uh, there are definitely some other perspectives here i'm open to the discussion i like talking about this stuff i like trying to uh you know one just getting other views but ultimately i will end off by saying you know do and i said this on the last video do what you're motivated to do because your motivation is what matters here a lot more than anything else because so often people you know especially if we try and force you down a particular route um, you know, if you're not like motivated by yourself to actually follow through, you know, you end up giving up and don't actually, well, follow through. Um, so, I mean, keep your own motivation or be aware of your own motivations, because if, if something interests you, it's way better just to do that than to worry about doing it the right way. Yeah, don't, don't take our points as like a checklist. Um they're just kind of like recommendations or whatever, but the, the motivation takes top priority. It's, it's a starting place based on like our personal experience and what we maybe will prefer to know when we were getting started. Yeah. So we kind of touched on this a little bit in the last video, but uh, we will quickly open this video as well by asking you know, why is Vuln Research the next step? Why not just jump directly into trying to write a, a, a real world exploit on like end days or something? Um, so like you technically could do that. Uh, and I know in some teams, it is somewhat common for there to be like dedicated Vuln research people and dedicated exploit dev people, um, because generally people do like to specialize in one or the other as they are somewhat different skill sets, even though they're, they're related. But I think you should have at least a somewhat solid understanding of what goes into VR, even if you are not hoping to do that as like your full time main thing. Um, at best, it's something that could augment your exploit dev skills and could be useful for identifying something like flawed patches if you're doing variant analysis. At worst, it's something that you can fall back on um, if you, if you know some somebody you're working with is doing VR and needs help, or uh, it's just something that you want to take a break from exploit dev and maybe look for vulnerabilities. You can do that um, if you I have would, the initial knowledge. I would say like there there's a bit of a feedback loop between the two skill sets. Like they are different skills. And as you said, people do specialize. Um, but like as you learn more about vulnerability research and vulnerabilities in general, that will apply in terms of seeing new exploit primitives and seeing new strategies that you can take on the exploit development side. Like these do work together as you improve one, the other does come up with it. So once you've learned the basics of exploit development, once you've kind of seen that how a vulnerability turns into an exploit, I would argue, you know, start working on how do you actually find those vulnerabilities in the first place? Because learning about that, I think ultimately does help you with the exploit development, but you do need that foundation that's kind of skipped over if you only really do CTF. So um, you just don't really get that exposure to the longer term, more serious vulnerability research. And ultimately, there is no exploit dev without actually finding vulnerabilities in the first place. Yeah, like if you're working solo or in a small team, you'll probably need to end up doing both anyway. So, and I guess the other thing is like it's a long process. Vulnerability research is not a skill that you're going to learn overnight or in a weekend. I mean, you could learn to run a fuzzer, and if you want to call that having learned VR, then fine. But it's one of those things like. It's better to start it sooner and do it poorly, but just keep working on and slowly iterating and improving than to keep pushing it off. Uh, so that's kind of the other thing. It's such a long process. Just start now, start sooner, 
and you don't need to wait until you know everything to start looking for vulnerabilities. You can jump right in because there is a ton of bad software um, that you can start with at least. So you were talking about fuzzing. So let's talk about some of the various approaches you can take to VR. Uh, we'll leave fuzzing for last. We'll first touch on auditing. And by auditing, we mean doing code review to find issues, not trying to verify that a code style guide is being followed or something. Yeah, like yeah. Aud auditing has a lot of baggage to it. When, when we say like auditing a code base, that could mean like, you know, taking one of the ISO, whatever standards, and like, you know, following the checklist. That's not what we mean using it as a catch-all for just like auditing source code doing looking at source um or even like just any sort of static analysis so it could include reverse engineering at first unless your motivation it dictates otherwise i would recommend against like starting with a project that's going to require reverse engineering just because it's better to learn you know one skill focus on one skill at a time yeah, the reverse engineering to... adds another layer that you have to power through, which might hurt like the the motivation or want to continue on it even more because it's adding more workload on you. Yeah, so. and it's it's just adding an extra layer of effort. You're still kind of doing that same idea of auditing. It's just now you need to process everything through the fact that you're reverse engineering it first. But fundamentally, like you're still doing that analysis. It's just you're doing the analysis at a different level and needing to do that extra work. So just skipping that step when you're learning to do that analysis is better, um, in my opinion. But again, I mean, Spectre, you kind of started off on the PS4, I think, as like one of your first serious targets. Obviously, you didn't have source for that. And uh, well, I guess you would have had some of it where it overlaps with FreeBSD, but... I, yeah, it's kind of an interesting target in that respect, in that it's both open source and not open source. Um, the parts of the kernel that are typical in BSD, as you said, are open source, but then there's also the custom modifications where you don't have the source code that compiled to that. So it's not fully black box, but it's kind of in the middle, I guess. Um, and like you said, like the motivation matters more than anything. So yeah, like the PS4 was my first major modern world target that I looked at. And that's not really open source, or at least not the, the code that I was looking at. So in certain circumstances, feel free to, you know, throw that out the window with a starting code review with full open source. Um, but yeah, I mean, that depends on your situation. Yeah, I mean, it's your motivation again. I would recommend not diving in with RE, but if you're motivated to do it, I mean, obviously people can and people do dive right into it. I mean, game hacking actually is a huge way where people get started in, like, start learning those fundamental skills towards just security and hacking in general. Starting off with RE, starting off with a somewhat hard target. Uh, but yeah, for sure. I guess moving on, though, like, the other option there is doing more dynamic analysis. Um, I just kind of catch on, say, like, manual or, like, actual testing. I guess not necessarily manual, but... Um, that is kind of like another area. So binary analysis would be an example of that. Um, writing sort of analysis tooling or instrumentation, sanitizers, uh, doing anything like that, or just quite literally manually typing into a program and trying to execute and see if something breaks. I mean, uh, you'll see that a lot more on like web and higher level application security where, you know, people are just manually looking at the application versus looking at the source or reverse engineering it. Um, and those two kind of go hand in hand with fuzzing, where fuzzing, you could set up a fuzzer to just kind of like toss random things, or you can go a lot more complex with your fuzzing campaign and include information you've gained from like reverse engineering, from seeing the source, from your own testing. And then obviously the fuzzer itself is kind of a dynamic analysis. Uh, so they all kind of they all kind of draw on each other, but you can specialize in different areas. Yeah, so I guess we'll talk about some of the merits and drawbacks of each of those approaches. So auditing, I think auditing can be useful for finding those deeper vulnerabilities where you really have to have an understanding of how all the parts fit together in a particular subsystem or how multiple subsystems fit together in a, in a target. Um, so like trying to find logic bugs that lead to memory corruption or just logic bugs in general that let you do something you shouldn't be able to do that isn't immediately going to result in total compromise, but could be chained with something later on um, to 
to compromise the target. Yeah, like so, the auditing, you tend to be able to spot more subtle issues um, that you might not notice if you're just like dynamically testing it. Um, you might not notice that a few bits are always flipped, you know, info leak or something like that, uh, or something's uninitialized in some place. You might not notice that. But you will notice if you're actually looking at the source code and see it doing that. So, like, there's a chance for more subtle vulnerabilities. Yeah, basically, with your uh, with the auditing approach, I think your ultimate goal is to try to build a better understanding of whatever you're looking at uh, than what the developer had who wrote that code. So, like, maybe they didn't fully understand an underlying API they're using, and you understand uh, subtle implications that were just forgotten about when the code was being written or something. Um, trying to spot like just any little errors or mistakes like that, that m maybe a fuzzer or something wouldn't catch because it requires some specific state to be set up. Um, but if you're reading the code, you can spot, okay, that's an issue. How can I trigger that issue? Um, and it, it's funny, when you're talking about auditing, it sounds very simple, right? Just read the code and look for problems. But it's probably the hardest way of doing bone research because it's the most intensive in terms of the amount of effort you have to put into it and there's no timeline or like clear goal um it, it's very easy to get distracted or demotivated and just move on to something else um yeah, especially I mean, if a subsystem is really complicated you're kind of front loading all of this effort so fuzzing is kind of one of the other options where you run the fuzzer you get a crash and then you have to look and understand the code um, you're kind of working back, like uh, auditing, you're working towards finding where that crash would be. Fuzzing, you're working backwards. You've got the crash. Now, why did it happen? Uh, so you end up front loading a lot of information. That's where a lot of time can be added on to doing Vaughn research because you're needing to spend a lot of time just reading documentation, reading source code, and understanding the entire system before you really start finding vulnerabilities. Yeah, the other problem is there's not really as many resources on uh, doing code review because it's harder to teach than like writing tools and, and writing fuzzers. It's kind of something that you you mostly have to learn by doing it. Um, that said, we do have a few resources that we want to shout out for doing code review. Um, one of which is a book that's a bit older, but is still fairly relevant being the Art of Security Assessment. I think you've mentioned it a few times before, Z on yes, our podcast it is. as well as maybe some other discussion videos. I've, I've definitely mentioned I'm not sure on other discussion videos, but on the podcast for sure. It is, it's an older book. So going back, I want to say 2006 or 2007. That said, like the sections on it are actually about performing a software security assessment. So there are sections on it just about the high level process. Like how do you go through code? What are some strategies towards understanding the code that you're seeing? or working through the code, following, you know, data, tracing through it. How are you going to comprehend the code? There's a lot of really good, really deep information here. Like, this is probably one of the more technical books I've ever seen going into it. And even now, I'd still say it's one of the best resources on actually, like, doing an assessment against software. Now, it covers a lot more than just what we you would do exploit development on. It does cover higher-level things to look at. And even some of the places where you would expect it to be somewhat dated, like when it's talking about certain uh, protocols and stuff, like, realistically, a lot of the information it has is still quite relevant. There's definitely some dated things, like it has a, sec it has a couple of sections on Windows where, you know, it written... Like, what was 07? That was still, I want to say, Windows XP, maybe Vista by then. Um, it, You know, not really the modern Windows systems that we have now. Still some relevant concepts for sure, but on a whole, like, especially the first, I think it's about 10 chapters of the book, are still, you know, very relevant. It also goes into, like, some fundamental problems just with like native code or with C in particular would apply over to C++ code also. Uh, just some fundamental vulnerabilities there. So yeah, it, it's a really good book. Unfortunately, it's out of print, but you can still buy the Kindle version. There were a few things that I wanted to call out uh, from the code review uh, process section, uh, one of which was the detailing of the importance of what they call pre-assessment or recon. 
doing the initial research on the target before you even start looking at the code. Um, I think that is something that is sometimes undervalued. Um, people don't let me underestimate the importance of understanding exactly what the target is supposed to do and what uh, functionality it exposes. Um, because if, if you don't know that, I mean, yeah, you can maybe figure it out after you've read enough code, but you can save yourself a lot of time by doing that work up front. Um, another yeah, thing it calls out... One quote I like to mention on that topic is, you know, time spent in reconnaissance is seldom wasted and has the military implication, but I think it really applies towards doing vulnerability research. It's yeah. like, you know, take the time, build up your own understanding. It'll delay kind of the final results, like actually finding a bug, but it'll make the entire process so much better. Yeah, it's a good quote. Um, another thing it details is the differences and and upsides and downsides between the top down approach and the bottom up approach, uh, which both Z and I have touched on before in, in other discussions, uh, as well as the hybrid approach, kind of combining them uh, to create a model of a target to, to find issues. Yeah, actually, if I recall correctly, it talks about these strategies and then also kind of indicates where you'd want to use them. Because like, it's not that one is better than the other. Like, you should always do the hybrid because it's the best of both worlds or something. It depends on what you have. It depends on your uh, scenario. The book kind of covers that. I think getting into those details is probably beyond what we really want to cover in this discussion. But suffice it to say, there's a lot of really good content, despite the fact that it's an old book. Yeah, uh, the final thing that I liked was the emphasis they put on uh, doing notes. Um, I think people underestimate the importance of taking notes when you're doing assessments, um, because not only will that help you for if you come back to a target after a break or something, um, but similar to like school, just the act of taking notes forces you to understand the code better and kind of cements your, your understanding of it better. So I think that's that's a good point that I, I liked that the book called out. It's also, you know, your notes are also like your um, uh, augmented memory or your artificial memory. You can look back on that and remind yourself of things you've probably forgotten. Uh, but yeah. that said, I think we could probably start talking because we're already kind of touching on it. But, you know, how do you actually start an auditing project um, unless you want to get into why not? Actually, I guess that does remind me of one point choosing between like doing this sort of auditing versus fuzzing this is where i think we'll get some people who disagree uh on why yeah. we're saying you know get to auditing instead of fuzzing first fuzzing seems like a really natural choice and fuzzing is insanely effective at finding bugs or unreasonably effective despite that like fuzzing you're especially when you're first learning, you're just going to be learning to run a tool. You run the tool, it gives you a crash, and then you either need to triage it, which requires some understanding of the vulnerabilities, unless it even gives you a repro and makes things really easy on you. Uh, but you're kind of left where, one, you're not really learning to do the vuln research. The fuzzer's doing it for you. Um, so while fuzzing, I think, is really important and is should be part of your ultimate like methodology and how you go about approaching a new target. You should be including fuzzing in there. But in terms of like what the next step is while you're learning, I would say fuzzing just kind of takes you right back to you get a crash, you go into exploit dev. You're not really learning the vuln research at that point. Um, I mean, you can, I don't want to have to be careful because I don't want to like downplay the value of fuzzing or the difficulty of fuzzing. Like a good fuzzing campaign is more than just like, toss AFL++ plus plus it and see what happens. Uh, like, there, there's a lot of effort that goes into the campaign, that goes into, like, deciding on the corpus or creating some corpus for it if you need to, or creating rules or however it's set up, whatever type of fuzzing you're doing. There's a lot that goes into that process that is really beneficial. I just think it should be the second part that you learn. Yeah, so, like you kind of touched on, if you're going to be hitting modern targets... Unless it's a target that's not really hit by a lot of people, you are going to want to do smart fuzzing. You're going to want to use like coverage guidance and um, you know some smart data generation, which you will augment by doing the bone research. Right, it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, so well, you'll augment by doing the um, doing the auditing or by doing that. Yeah. I mean, we can call fuzzing bone research too. I don't want to disclude. Uh, Fuzzing from VR because it really yeah, is part of it. I, that's just a term thing, but 
yeah, I mean, it, it should be part of the process. It's just not yet. Not not at first. At first, you know, focus on the fundamentals. Yeah, not only that, also root causing is just going to be really tough for you if you if you don't understand the code base very well. Um, you're going to be spending a lot of time root causing and triaging, and triaging is like the most important thing with fuzzing, um, because you could find a, a million issues. If they're null dereferences or something, then they're probably not worth your time. So yeah, Although being able to reference assess, it, it's pretty easy to tell. You shouldn't spend time on it. For sure, but there are some other types of issues where they are either really difficult or impossible to exploit that aren't as obvious, uh, and you don't want to be wasting a ton of time on those. So, yeah, the, the VR skill is important to have. So, like like you said, starting with auditing makes sense, uh, in my opinion. Um, choosing a good project that keeps you interested and engaged is really important. Like we kind of talked about earlier, for me it was the PS4, um, because... Yeah, like the hardest thing with auditing is just how discouraging and daunting it is. So you need a, a goal to keep you on track. Um, so for me, that was the PS4 when I was learning. Yeah, although, I mean, in terms of an actual recommendation, I mean, if I were telling somebody who's getting started, I wouldn't maybe tell them to go for the PS4 or I guess the PS5 now. I'd, as we, we already mentioned this earlier, but not really doing reverse engineering as part of your first you know, project or so, you know, choose something open source, probably something with active development. Active development tends to introduce more bugs just because there's more code moving around. Um, ideally, you know, some that's maybe not going to be as picked over, like isn't an insanely hard target. Uh, not a it, browser. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sure somebody's probably written some bad browser out there too, although I don't know how much active development that would get. But, you know, if it's not picked over, it's you kind of you can get some easy wins off the bat just to remind yourself, yes, you really can do this. Oh, uh, you know, like I said, there's a lot of bad software out there. Uh, just finding even some random projects on GitHub to take a look at. Oh, uh, yeah, your own motivation matters here. But ideally, I'd say, you know, choose an open source project with some sort of interesting technology, something that you're actually interested in, something that's going to hook you into it. And that hasn't yet been too terribly picked over or picked over at all. Uh, open source libraries and dependencies are probably like a really good target for that kind of thing. Um, something that's used, but it's not going to be reviewed probably too much. Uh, maybe like one or two people have looked at it, but you know, if, if it's not a super popular dependency that's used by very uh, monolithic projects, then yeah, I think that's probably a good middle ground to, to target for. Um, but yeah, one thing you, uh, you've you said before in the past, C, is you want people to avoid tips and tricks when they're learning. Yeah, I, that, that makes it sound pretty bad, actually. Uh, when So t when I talk about tips and tricks, it's like, you know, you'll see somebody on Twitter give like a few steps that you can follow to test for a particular vulnerability. Really useful in a sense. But they leave you with this really shallow understanding where you're just kind of following a few steps. Think about like somebody testing for, you know, SQL injection by just going around and entering a single quote into every text box they see. It'll work. They might be able to find some SQL injection that way. But like they don't understand really what they're doing. They don't understand finding the input. So other places that they might be able to enter it or do the same thing. Um... And so with kind of doing the auditing, I would recommend not trying to follow just if you find some tip for how to find some bug, try to understand the bug rather than understanding or try to gain a what I'd refer to as like an intuitive understanding of the vulnerability rather than just how to find it. Uh, because understanding the vulnerability, you'll understand kind of the cases that lead to it rather than just the way to find it. That, that's a good way to summarize it. So, yeah, I, I guess, mean, sorry, I will add also, like, the tips and tricks are useful. Like, you add them to your toolbox once you already know how to use your normal tools, rather than filling your toolbox with, with a bunch of gimmicks. Yeah. The problem with those, like, gimmicks and, and tips and tricks is that they don't really teach you the, the methodology behind it, right? So... I guess that's what we're, where we'll go to next, right? Is talking about the methodology, um, the general steps if you were trying to, you know, ramp into a, a target to, to get started with. 
So learning your environment is probably a good place to start learning. How do you interact with the software? Where does it take inputs? Um, where do outputs go? Is it using file for IO or is it using, you know, STDN, STDO? What is it? How is it interacting with you? Um, yeah, I mean, if you're dealing with open source, I mean, compile and run the code. Just figure out how to actually build it, how to configure that build, and importantly, how to have debugging information in there and how to attach your debugger and use a debugging environment. Like, step one is just being able, I'd argue, to just debug the program. At least if you're going to be able to. There are some scenarios where that isn't really an option. Yeah. After you have that environment set up, it makes sense to explore the project and see, okay, what kind of subsystems exist in here? Um, which directory or which set of source files are responsible for what set of actions? Um, I think the term that you've used before, Z, is like grokking it. Um, yeah, grok I. I'm not sure where the term actually comes from. I think it's like from Star Trek or something. My manager used it, and I love the term. Uh, but it just means to like understand intuitively. Uh, that is, you're not following like some steps to recreate it or something. It's you can intuitively reason about it. Um, and I think that's important when you're you just explore the application. Don't worry about finding bugs. Be able to just think about it and like gain an understanding of how data is flowing through and how the components interact, how kind of the whole thing works. Um, just so you're able to reason about and think about it, you know, in your head, like you don't need to look everything up. Like you've got this mental understanding or this mental picture of it. Um, I, I would never kind of set out just to memorize everything. It's, you know, having that intuitive understanding. Yeah. Um, once you have that environment set up and a good understanding of what the program is doing and how it works, then you can actually get into the auditing phase. Um, you know, looking at the source code, maybe so, setting up some fuzzing or, or testing. Um, yeah, before we go into choosing that next hire, I will also mention, like, on... So when I was working as a consultant, I'd have a number of projects that would involve either white box or mix analysis where I have both source and I've got a live environment. But I would spend up to like 20% of my time just doing all this background, just exploring the application. Like my first couple days, first few days, I wouldn't care about finding things. I would care about understanding how the whole application flows. That way, you know, when I actually do start finding things, you know, I have that fundamental understanding rather than trying to dive right into just finding issues. And I will say it helps, you know, just learn how to develop similar applications. You want to attack a kernel, just learn about kernel development. You know, I think both both of us kind of talked about modern operating systems. Uh, Tadenbaum's book as being kind of a good resource for, you know, kernel stuff. Maybe you're not going towards that, but it's not a book that, I mean, it is, it's about what, Minix or whatever his operating system was. It's not exactly relevant but it helps to understand the concepts and the problems developers are facing and thinking about. Yeah, like the producer and consumer problem, for example. Yeah, like un understanding those problems is, you know, another good place when you're dealing with some applications, understanding what problems they see. What are the traditional academic problems? Because usually, you know, the code's being written in a way to solve those, and there very well might be some bugs with it. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so once you've got that fundamental understanding, then you could start actually choosing a more narrow target. Assuming like you're looking at a large library, a large application, you're not just going to audit the entire thing in one go. You're going to focus on like a component or a data flow or something else. You'll you'll have some particular focus. And once you understand it, you can actually choose that. So that's kind of the next step is choosing your target. Yeah. Um and I will say, like, that background information is important, which is why when we cover topics and, and write-ups on the podcast, we love to see the background information, um, which I will quickly plug as well. If you're looking to get into uh, Vuln Research, I think a good series you could look at is Google Project Zero's, like, in the wild series, or just any of Project Zero's write-ups. Some of them are really dense, but... It, it just shows you how much effort goes into a target and the kinds of like the methodology behind how they find issues. Um, and those insights are transferable to whatever you're doing. So Project Zero is another place where I'd say read some of the blog posts that interest you um, 
they'll have some insights and, and takeaways that you can utilize on your own. Um, so yeah, once you have, you know, that background knowledge, um, you can get into actually auditing the target, doing the code review. Yeah. Um, I guess one last ad there is as you're, as you're choosing kind of the sub target that you're going to focus on at first, you're not really going to have a good idea of where the bugs are going to be. And I mean, it is always kind of shot in the dark, but over time you will start building an intuition about it. Uh, so I would recommend just kind of keeping track of, um, after you've chosen an area, do try and keep track. If somebody else ends up finding a vulnerability in the same area, uh, just to see if you kind of, if your hunch was right about where bugs might be, or if you find vulnerabilities, by all means, like if you find the vulnerabilities, track that, but I assume you would. Um, just kind of keep track of how your own kind of intuition is developing. Uh, because there is... There's no real way, like, to say, like, you've got to train your intuition. Like, that's doesn't really make much sense. But it is kind of a thing. Like, intuition kind of matters when it comes to the auditing, especially on a large project. We're just like, where do I think there's going to be vulnerabilities? What are bug farms you've seen in other applications? So at first, you don't have much background to draw on, but over time, you will. And... Fuzzing, uh, like we mentioned earlier, can actually be useful for um, that initial phase of like, okay, where do I want to look for vulnerabilities? Where do I want to do the deeper code auditing? Because if you're looking at like, um, you know, like a kernel or something to keep it on the operating system example, there's going to be a lot of subsystems. There's going to be file system, networking stack. It's going to be, it's, it's kind of overwhelming to think, where do I want to look? Um, so fuzzing can be helpful there if you want to, get started into the fuzzing, um, trying to find where there might be issues, um, fuzzing can be useful for that because it'll likely hit the lower hanging fruit. And if you find a subsystem that has a lot of low hanging fruit, then it's likely you'll find a lot of the deeper issues too. Yeah, um, I mean, and it's an interesting target to look at. Yeah, bugs don't really exist in isolation. Where there's one, there's likely more. So knowing where other bugs have been found, I mean, one of the suggestions was to choose some that isn't too picked over, so you might not really have too much insight or previous work to go off of. But if you do, I mean, looking at where other bugs have been found and kind of over time, I mean, eventually, you know, other people realize, hey, this is a bug farm. They start picking over that area. So like when you're starting, I wouldn't recommend necessarily doing that, especially if there's been a lot of bugs um, and it's kind of slowed down here on the tail end. It's just going to be harder versus um, some that's had, you know, maybe a couple bugs and hasn't been picked over yet. But part of that is just going to be with choosing your initial target, your big target, as some that isn't too picked over yet. Yeah. A final point I want to say on fuzzing that kind of falls into that same line of avoiding the uh, just quick tips and tricks for doing auditing uh, it's don't fall into the academic traps for fuzzing. Um, there are a lot of like academic papers and stuff looking at these new like novel ways to fuzz, and it's it's very easy to get sucked in and try to follow that and see if you can apply it to your target. Um, and like maybe sometimes those projects that come out of the academia are worth looking at just to see if they could apply to your uh, target. But it feels like a lot of the times they're not really useful outside of very specific use cases. Um, and like some people I've talked to who do fuzzing research as well as personal experiences kind of showed that in terms of like pure technology and introspection with fuzzing, nothing has really surpassed just like coverage guidance. It's still kind of the top dog with like AFL. So yeah, focus more on the result of fuzzing and less on like the um, intricacies of the process, I guess. Don't try to apply like some quick tip to think you'll get some major advantage or something. Yeah, and, um, and if fuzzing is your area of interest eventually and you like want to dig into that, by all means, I mean, try out some new things. Um, I mean, Gamozo Labs does a lot of work with fuzzing, a lot of interesting work with like building fuzzers and all that. Like there's a lot of room to research there, but I expect to say like, there's also a little bit of a trap of, you know, the latest and greatest research paper that maybe cherry picked some of their data, maybe not. Yeah, I mean, we, we've covered some of those on the podcast, and I think that could actually be a topic all on its own that we might do a video on in the future. It's just buzzing in isolation um, and like the, the research and active de development going on there.
So I guess one of the next steps, once you've kind of chosen your sub-target or kind of gone into that subfield, is how do you actually start doing your auditing? And we've talked a little bit about this already versus the fuzzing and all of that. I mean, at this point, it's like you've set up your environment, you've got the debugging, you're going to want to use that. Um, you know, source and debugging, they go hand... I, like, I guess I, I keep saying that term a lot, but they go hand in hand. Use both of them if you have both. Um... Kind of as a tip here of something you might want to do. Because um, one of the things is, while well, we could just tell you, you know, go audit, go follow. Well, but you want to build up certain skills, certain sub skills. One of the things I'd say is as you're just looking at code, if you see something weird, take the time, just set a breakpoint, and then try and figure out how to hit that code. Um, doesn't matter if you actually think there's a vulnerability. Just doing that practice of trying to, of just tracing through code to figure out how to hit it. Um, mapping out your attack surface yeah like just going through that process is kind of teaching you it's help it's developing that skill of reading code of understanding code uh, so i'd say just set a breakpoint try and hit it i mean it, it seems stupid it seems kind of obvious but just doing that intentionally to build up that skill because it is an important sub skill that you do need to kind of develop, and you will end up doing it naturally, but, you know, if, if you know something weird, just create the s situation to do it, just as like a a way of practicing. Um, so one of the things I do want to do also with the exploit dev topic, which will, is our next video, is talking a little bit more about how you could build up some of the fundamental skills without necessarily needing to, or how you can practice just the skills rather than needing to, like, do the entirety of all auditing. Uh, so that's kind of one of those skills is just being able to look through code and figure out how to hit it. Um, the other way is kind of doing the reverse process. You find a weird behavior in the application, so you're manually testing, you're manually working there. Find the code that actually cause, either causes that or like find the code that implements that function. Again, it's kind of obvious when I say it there, so it feels like it's one of those no-duh things, but... You know, just... Doing that process in reverse, so you find the functionality, find the code for it. Um, and the other thing, get some practice just going from a data sync, or going from a data source, sorry, to the actual sync, or where, where it's being used, just following data flow, and practicing just well, following the flow of data in your debugger or in code. Uh, you should probably get practice doing both. Like Those are kind of, I guess, the four skills that you'd want to practice while you're looking at doing auditing. Um, yeah. And each of those methods can also kind of expose you to where there might be vulnerabilities, especially I tend to use the um, going from source to sync a lot, just following the data flow. Because you'll see where it's like, oh, every data flow I see, you know, hits this function. This one doesn't. This is the odd one out. Why is that? Or is that vulnerable now or something? So it's just a good practice to do as like, that's how you practice one of those particular skills. You um, want to get comfortable with cross-referencing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I'd like, agree there. Now, when it comes to the actual, like, strategy behind your auditing, we've already mentioned the book, Art of Software Security Assessment. Excellent book. We're not going to dive into everything, but I will say, just as, like, a few notes or tips, one is just being systematic in your approach. Uh, a quote I like is, plans are useless, but planning is essential. I, again, tying back to when I worked as a consultant, I hated writing my test plans, my threat models, but the process of doing the threat modeling, the process of doing the test plans was insanely useful. Ultimately, it helped, it helped solidify my own understanding of the applications. So, I mean, just being systematic in your approach is, you know, you don't need to write everything out, but... Don't just take shortcuts. Don't just jump around a lot. Know what you're doing and kind of follow at least somewhat of a plan. Uh, but as you're learning this, don't be afraid to try things your own way. Uh, there are there are various resources that I recommend um, that kind of act as a starting place for you. Use those. Build on them yourself. Everybody kind of has their own methodology. Uh, you know, figure out what works for you. Uh, as long as you're really not cutting for us. And Spectre already touched on this, but take notes. Notes of your understanding of something. Notes when something seems non-standard. 
notes of anything that stands out. Uh, just for any reason to you, just take a lot of notes because you can refer to those after uh, when you're thinking like, OK, you know, how what are the side effects of this function call or something? It's like, well, what do your notes say? And I guess tying things back together, Spectre already mentioned the layman's guide to zero day engineering. It has a methodology within it for ramping up on a new project. I would not recommend it as like your starting place, how you ramp up on any project now um, as you're learning. But once you've kind of got the fundamentals of it, they have some suggestions for like how to actually approach a real project uh, where you need to get up to speed on a hard target. Um, it won't help if you don't have a target that's already picked over where there's already a lot of existing research. research. Or, well, it still will help a bit, but um, it, it's for a different type of target than what you might be starting off with. But it's still worth taking a look at, watching the first half of it. Well, the whole thing's actually good, but, but yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that. Yeah, a, a final point I just want to say on like Vuln Research is if you find a vulnerability quickly... Um, especially like this goes doubly so for fuzzing. If you find it really quickly, just using like a standard setup, odds are other people are also going to be able to find it just as quickly. So that's where doing the deeper analysis, doing a lot of the background research, um, doing code review, like that's where the value really comes into play is you're going to find those deeper issues that not everyone can find because not everyone is going to put a bunch of effort into researching a target. So that's just one thing I like to say, like up front, especially when it comes to fuzzing, because um, it's easy to get issues out of a fuzzer and think, hey, I'm doing stuff and this is working really well. Um, but you might not understand, like, there's probably a thousand other people that might be running the same fuzzer and might have found that issue too. So um, yeah, if it's easy to find for you, it it's probably easy to find for other people too. Yeah, so. I mean, fu fuzzing tends to shake out some good results after you do the work to really train your fuzzer and set it up. And I will say that's kind of touching on just what you do next. Like you've learned how to audit source code. You can pick up the reverse engineering. You can go into fuzzing. I'd say fuzzing because it is such a natural thing. It's something you could just kind of run in the background in a sense. And then you feed into it as you do the research into the project. You feed that back into your fuzzer which then makes your fuzzer better. You're getting better at like understanding the software. Everything just ties together. So I think it's a good next step. And I mean, there's a lot of tutorials on like using AFL++. There's a lot of conference presentations on fuzzing or fuzzing particular targets or different concepts behind it. Ultimately though, as I've said a few times, you know, you're following your own interests, following your own motivations, you know, do what motivates you. Uh, like th it's a huge field. You can go so many different ways here. For sure. Um, yeah, but I think I've pretty much touched on all my points. Do you have any additional ones, Z? Bring up? No, that's all. All right. Until cool. next time. All right. So uh, we'll wrap it up there for this discussion. Uh, thanks to everyone who tuned in. We'll be back in another discussion video where we focus on exploit development, um, and that'll be kind of the the final part of this little mini series. And uh, we'll see you all then.